Hey everyone, Tactics here with my final refresher guide of Season 4, where I'll be walking you through no code Offensive, reminding you of the important trash and boss abilities that you need to be aware of, and going over changes we saw into the dungeon on the PTR. If you're looking for a full list of every ability in the dungeon or a simple pug-friendly route to start out the season, make sure you do check out my Season 4 ability spreadsheet, my pug route video, or my written guides in collaboration with Method, all of which are going to be linked down in the description below. Otherwise, let's start by talking about dragon riding as in this massive dungeon, you are actually able to get on your flying mounts and move around and you will need to in order to get around quickly. This basically just functions like it does in the outside world. So you do want to make sure you have all of your dragon riding points with the added bonus of tornadoes being spread around throughout the dungeon that you can use flying straight through them to get a bit of upwards lift. So use that if you need some more height. You can also mount your regular flying mounts now that that is unlocked in Dragonflight. But dragon riding is definitely faster, so if you can use those, do use those. And you can even use the ride along system for dragon riding as well. Since you can fly, you do have the freedom to pick whichever of the first three bosses uh, in any order you want to do them. But I recommend starting on one side of the map and then moving across to the other. So that means that we're going to go to Granith. First, there are a few mobs in this area to be aware of. The Noku Lance Masters are a big lieutenant mob, and they've got the Cleaving Strikes ability, so they will constantly have their autos cleaving. So tanks, make sure these guys are faced away. They also have an important kick in Disruptive Shout, so make sure that gets interrupted. And note that the Plane Stompers in this area also have that same interrupt. Noku War Spears are going to be putting out a lot of damage, both on your tank and a ranged player, with their Swift Stab ability, which always targets the furthest available player, so you can bait who this goes on. It's a physical hit and stacking bleed. You can also stop this ability mid-charge by using some sort of AoE CC or, or ranged single target CC to stop it. And on top of that, in my root video, I go over the pillars in this area, which you can use to negate this ability entirely. Noku Horn Sounders have the important stoppable cast in this area with Rally the Clan. This will do an AoE enrage on everything nearby, so you really want to make sure you use a CC to prevent this ability from going off. Beastmasters are the other important mob in this area. They come with a companion, and when they cast Hunt Prey, that companion will enrage and will try and fixate whoever this mob hunters marked earlier in the pull. So you want to make sure you use a CC on the actual Beastmaster cast or an interrupt on the cast. If that's missed, you can also CC the mob or soothe the mob to remove that enrage, and that will also solve this ability. After clearing mobs around all three of the Dragon Killer Lances in this area, Granith will land and you'll be able to take him on. These lances are actually important to the boss fight itself, as one at a time they'll begin to reload until a player can actually interact with it to shoot it at the boss, dealing 5% of his health in damage, stunning him for 5 seconds, and resetting his phase timers. Usually this is done by the healer, but anyone with range can do this. While these lances are reloading, there's going to be a Nokud Saboteur that spawns across from it, and they're just going to run straight at the lance, fixated on it, and attempt to dismantle it before it can reload. So you want to make sure that you use slows, knockbacks, or stuns to prevent this mob from actually reaching the lance and just cleave it down near the boss. Alternatively, if you have a long-term CC, things like Polymorph, things like Imprison, you can actually keep these mobs CC'd indefinitely. So if a bunch of those, it can save you some damage on the mobs. Looking at the boss itself now, the scary hit is in Shards of Stone. This you'll likely need to defensive on higher Tyrannical keys, but otherwise for a lot of uh, mid key levels, being full health should be enough here. There's also the Tectonic Stomp AoE, which you just want to make sure you are out of. Finally, every 30 seconds or so, the boss will cast Eruption, which deals ramping damage with each tick. To stop this cast, you need to hit the boss with the reloaded Dragon Killer Lance that we talked about earlier. The key here, though, which is something a lot of people miss, is that you don't actually need to wait for the cast to start. You can just press the Lance on cooldown and it will reset the phase entirely, and you don't even need to take a single tick of the Eruption hit. This also actually has the added benefit of sometimes interrupting some of those Shards of Stone casts, so it also further reduces the damage intake of your party if you just press it on CD. After killing Granith, you can head west towards the Raging Tempest area where you have a bunch of Stormcaller mini bosses. Basically, there's four totems in this area that are guarded by a Stormcaller. And once you've defeated all four totems, that's when you can fight 
the boss. The totems don't do a ton of interest, but the storm callers do. They have storm bolt, which is just a random target hit, but this is a scary, scary random target hit, especially if it overlaps with literally any other ability. You want to make sure this is interrupted every time. Of course, these are Lieutenant Moms, so you can't CC them, so it just kicks on this ability. They also have a scary AoE hit in Totemic Overload, but this is only cast if the totem that this Stormcaller is attached to is still alive. So if you focus on that totem quickly, this AoE just never happens. These mobs are often joined by Noku Neophytes, who just have that same Stormbolt cast, or Primalist Storm Speakers, who have another cast in Tempest, which is a channeled AoE that applies a stacking magic dot. So again, something you really, really want to make sure is interrupted, but also because this mob can actually be CC'd, you can use a stun or anything like that to prevent the cast as well. Patrolling around the boss area, there's going to be a Primalist Thunder Beast. These guys have an important interrupt in the Thunder Strike. Again, this mob is not CCable, so you want to make sure kicks go into this ability. And if you're going to miss a kick, make sure the target does pop a defensive. From there, you'll be able to take on the Raging Tempest itself, which is a stationary boss. And tanks will want to make sure they stay in melee. Otherwise, they're going to be bombarded with the Wind Burst ability. So keep that in mind. You will also take heavy taking damage if you move under the boss, so you don't want to get too close either. On the topic of tanks, occasionally the boss is going to gain the Energy Surge magic buff for additional attack speed and nature damage. So if you have a purge, you can remove this effect. And if you don't, tanks, just be aware of it. You may need to use a defensive here for that extra damage intake. Now, constantly throughout the boss fight, they'll be spitting out orbs of uncontrollable energy all around and that slowly move inwards. While these orbs will damage any player that touches them, they also give a stacking 5% damage and healing increase for 20 seconds, going all the way up to 10 stacks. So you really want to grab and maintain this throughput buff as long as you possibly can. At the same time, you need to soak these orbs before they reach the boss, as if they touch the boss, they'll instead do a big party hit and give the boss a 5% damage increase, but this one lasts for a minute. So you really want to avoid that from happening even if you're already at max stacks to make collecting orbs a bit harder the boss sometimes debuffs all players with lightning strike forming a 15 yard aoe around them that detonates after a few seconds and it will destroy any orbs hit in the process turning them into swirlies that you instead need to make sure you stay away from these are quite big so it means that your group kind of needs to spread around the entire area of the boss room and just keep in mind that while you do want to soak orbs it's not worth cleaving your friends here with this ability and as long as the orbs don't go into the boss missing out on a few by destroying them with this ability is not a huge deal there's also a pretty nasty intermission phase on this boss with the electrical storm channel that happens at 100 energy dealing heavy party damage for 15 seconds you want to make sure you are staggering through defensives and healing cds here to allow you to survive and to make this easier you can be nice to your healer and let them pick up some orbs for that healing buff speaking of the orbs they actually don't spawn during this phase but it is possible to actually maintain your buff throughout this intermission and into the next boss phase if you soak one of the orbs that spawned at the end of the boss phase, the previous one, as late as possible. So just get up near the boss and let it just pat into you, and that should help you maintain your buff. After that boss is done, we continue to move westward, this time into the Tira and Maruk graveyard area, where we have more mini bosses you need to defeat in Soul Harvester. So these guys have an important kick in Death Bolt Volley, which as it sounds, just shoots a bolt of shadow damage to all players. So interrupt this. Again, not a CCable mob, so you need to use kicks. They also have Shatter Soul. This actually targets three players, deals a hit of shadow damage, and applies a 30% damage done reduction to you for 15 seconds. And basically, to remove that debuff from you, you need to find the orb that was shot out of you. It's your soul, which is now slowly moving towards that mini boss. So you need to go pick it up before it gets to the mini boss. Otherwise, the mini boss will gain a damage increase. This is an important reworked mob in this area in the desecrated Ahuna. These guys kind of fly around and they can get aggroed and they have the rotting wind cast. This used to be a frontal. This is now a big AOE hit and it can be interrupted or CC'd. So you want to make sure none of these casts get off. Otherwise, there's going to be a nasty disease and dot on your entire group. And very, very scary high priority mobs here. Once you've defeated all four soul harvester mini bosses in the area, you'll be Able to take on Tira and Maruk, two bosses that share health. However, note that Tira isn't actually tankable as she just randomly kind of jumps around the room and spams quick shot at random players. This ability isn't too scary on its own, but if it overlaps with another source of damage or if it picks the same person multiple times in a row, it can get dangerous fast. So be ready to use things like health potions and defensives when needed. On top of that, Tira will occasionally use Repel to instantly knock players back and then continuously channel a interruptible pushback afterwards, so make sure you kick that as quick as you can. 
For tanks, you just need to pick up Maruk. Make sure you use a defensive when he does his brutalized cast on you, and then just drag him around the room to wherever Tira jumps in order to maximize cleave. Outside of that, Maruk just does a Frightful Roar ability, which everyone will want to move out of to avoid getting feared. Both bosses have an ultimate ability here when they reach about 100 energy. For Tira, that is Gale Arrow, which is a big hit to all players except the tank, and then spawns tornadoes on their position that shoot outwards for several seconds before moving back to the initial spawn location. This is what you want to make sure you are defensiving again because of that quick shot wombo combo and just because it's a big hit and to help deal with dodging easier you can actually stack your group up and then all the tornadoes are fixated from a single spot you can also opt to instead have two stacks of players to reduce movement of range players by having one stack out at range and one stack in melee that might make your life easier whatever works for you for maruk's ultimate he has earth splitter which fires off three waves of lines that target two players randomly per wave leaving behind a puddle for a few seconds this again is easier to dodge if your group is either stacked up or in a line and then you can just have everyone rotate in the same direction so that the puddles take up the least amount of space possible after defeating Tira and Maruk, you can fly straight towards Nokudun Hold, which has a no-fly zone in a perimeter around it, but luckily there is actually a spot near the southern entrance up a cliff just beside it you can sneak into, which I'll show you on screen right now, and that allows you to get pretty close to the final boss without actually needing to hoof it uh, a pretty long distance. So I definitely recommend aiming for that cliff just to speed up your run. There's some familiar mobs in this area that have abilities we've already talked about, but there's also two mini bosses I do want to briefly talk about in Balara and Batak. These mobs are actually tied to the boss. If you pull the boss, they will aggro you, but there is a strategy for higher keys where players will uh, tag these two mobs and then someone else will take the boss and they'll use a combat drop to reset them. So that is possible, but let's assume you pull them. Uh, Balara has the vehement charge ability. This is a line attack and charge at the closest player that deals physical damage and knocks back. So you can actually have this target your tank if your tank stands right up next to them and your melee stand at max range and this will always target your tank makes it easier you can just face it towards the wall so the boss doesn't move but talk is the other one he's got a kick in blood curdling shout you want to make sure that always gets interrupted as it's a big hit and six second fear this other ability is broad Stomp, which is just a tank targeted frontal cone and again this doesn't hit too hard for tanks you can actually just pull both these mobs up against a wall and kind of stand still and just eat the charges and eat the broad stomp and just keep these mobs in one spot make them easy to cleave down from there you can take on balakar khan which is a two-phase fight with an intermission between them starting with phase one this is the unempowered phase which goes until you push the boss below 60 percent hp this boss has a couple different combo abilities here. The first is tank targeted, which will use rending strike, applying a 10 second bleed and damage amp to his second hit, savage strike. Tanks, you want to make sure that you will have a defensive running for that second hit here, or use a bleed cleanse before it happens to get rid of that damage amp. There's also a random target combo, which goes out with iron spear. This deals splash damage around the targeted player and is followed by the iron stampede cast, causing the boss to charge towards that same player. All players, of course, will want to avoid that charge attack, and the targeted player may want to use defensive for that spear hit on higher tyrannical keys, but usually being topped is enough. Of note, combat drops like Vanish or Shadow Meld will stop that entire combo if you use them before the spear is thrown on you, and if you don't have those, there's actually a helpful rock on the southern end of the boss room, which you can hide behind and count as terrain, so it will cancel the boss's charge if you hide behind it, so I always recommend taking the boss near this spot. Outside of that, there's just a random target frontal ability in upheaval that also deals quake splash damage to every player. So just make sure you aren't too far from the boss so you can avoid the cone and you are loosely spread out so you don't cleave each other. Once you push the boss below 60%, he summons four storm casters in the center of the room and he goes to immune to damage until you defeat them. These mobs will just spam cast storm bolt on random targets. So you want to keep them interrupted. All while making sure you avoid the lightning swirlies on the ground and you survive the constant storm winds ticking damage. After killing these mobs, you'll now be in the empowered boss phase, causing his abilities to gain additional lightning themed effects. You also need to continue dodging those lightning swirlies from the intermission in this phase. For tanks, the combo is now Conductive Strike, which applies a magic dot and damage amp to the Thunder Strike follow up. But since this is a magic effect, it should be dispelled by the healer as soon as possible. Meaning that in this phase, tanks, you actually want a defensive the first hit of the combo. That's actually scarier now because there's going to be no damage amp on the second hit. His new spear attack is Static Spear, which grips the entire party to the player's location on hit, meaning you all need to be ready to scatter to avoid the charge attack, or again, this is where that rock comes in handy, just hide behind that rock together and avoid that frontal entirely. 
finally, the random target frontal is now crackling upheaval, which also causes all players to leave behind a crackling cloud puddle after the splash damage hits. So you want to make sure to drop these out of the way, especially not blocking that rock that I mentioned if you're using it. And also, this is probably the best defensive spot in the fight as it's very easy to just get instantly one shot here from that quake damage combined by the ticking cloud puddle but that is it for this guide video guys hopefully you found it useful and if you did be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content like it including 0.1 title key walkthrough roots and more tank dungeon and raid guide content throughout the war within of course i need to give a massive thank you to my patreons for their ongoing support could not do this without you and i'll see everyone in the next video